Good evening. Hello. Are we ready to start? So, welcome to the PhD in Educational Neuroscience Distinguished Lecture hosted at Gallaudet University. Welcome to those here in the auditorium, to the VL2 Professor, Legacy, uh, Professor Eden, Legacy Scientist uh, for VL2 from Georgetown University, and all the professors from the nearby universities that come to our talks. Welcome to those also live streaming uh, across the country. This lecture series aims to honor world-renowned scientists in the field of psychology, education, cognitive sciences, and neuroscience. These different fields, and all the interdisciplinary fields in between, contribute to the new and growing field of educational neuroscience. They increase our understanding of the human mind, but more so of the human learning mechanisms in their cognitive and neural dimensions. This year's Distinguished Lecture Series theme is breaking down barriers. With our distinguished lectures in the heart of DC, we want to build bridges across fields and scientific communities in the area and across the nation. Everyone is welcome to attend in person, and we hope many may enjoy these exceptional talks wherever they are through, their, through our live streaming service. Again, this week, we've, had, we've received so many emails inquiring how to uh, log on and follow us. We are delighted and honored to have Dr. Hirsch accept our invitation. Thank you very much in the name of everyone. Professor of Psychiatry, Neurobiology, and Neuroscience, former director and founder of the Functional MRI Research Center and the Program of, for Imaging and Cognitive Science at Columbia University. She is now at Yale School of Medicine to lead the new Brain Functional Laboratory. She has received her master's degree from Portland State University and her PhD in psychology from Columbia University. She received in 2009 the prestigious George Gamow Distinguished Scientist Award. This award recognizes scientists for their accomplishments and covers fields ranging from physics to geosciences, to chemistry, biology, and more. As a note, among the recipients of this award are several Nobel Prize winners. She has also served as curator for the Brain Exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History, and was featured as one of the five women scientists in 2011 World Science Festival. Describing in a short paragraph, Dr. Hirsch's work is challenging. The breadth of her research is impressive. Her work ranges from developing brain mapping procedures for neurosurgical applications to development of imaging diagnostics for autism, from basic research on the neural processes that mediate emotion, anxiety disorders, and their treatment strategies, to the neural mechanisms for cognitive control and conceptual representation pioneer in the use of the functional magnetic resonance imaging, Dr. Hirsch is now breaking new barriers by entering the world of hyperscanning. Her current work now aims to understand the neural processes that underlie interpersonal communication by using multi-brain scanning to unveil the complexities of social interactions. The title of today's presentation is The New Neuroscience of Two, communicating eye to eye. An accomplished scientist and a role model for young women in science, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hirsch. Thank you, Alaria, for that, uh, that introduction. And thank all of you for inviting me today to give this lecture. It has been an incredible honor to spend time with all of you today, and I have learned more from you about my topic than, um, than, I, did than I understood before I came here today, that you have taught me a great deal about what I'm going to try to tell you about, so thank you very much. I also want to thank our, my interpreters today. Um, this is a new experience for me, to have one of my lectures translated with ASL, and I think that's a real honor, so thank you very much. 
Um, today, I am very excited about uh, telling you about some new work that I think does indeed break some important barriers. In neuroscience, we study the human brain one brain at a time. And we have learned a great deal about the principles of neural organization of single brains. But we know very little about one of the most important functions of all human behaviors. And that is the functions that relate to interpersonal interaction, the connections one to the other. The brain is exquisitely designed to connect with other brains. And yet, as neuroscientists, we haven't been able to understand that neural circuitry. And it's not that we haven't been smart enough to understand that this is an important idea. It is that we haven't had the technology to study two brains at a time. And so today, I'm going to tell you about some breakthroughs in first technology which allows us to study two brains in interaction simultaneously. And then I'm going to use that technology to test a very simple hypothesis. And that simple hypothesis is that our brains in interaction are utilizing neural circuitries that are different than they are in solo activities. And that's the breakthrough. That's what's really exciting, that we can learn something about the brain that we haven't learned before that teaches us how to do better experiments and perhaps how to understand our language systems better. So here we go. Um, the first element of interpersonal interaction is eye-to-eye -eye contact. Um, and we all know how central eye-to-eye -eye contact is to interpersonal interrelations. Secondly, dialogue, that is conversation between two people, is very important in interpersonal interactions. And yet, neither of these very elemental components of communication are well understood. And that is because, as I said in my introduction, we study functional imaging, study the brain, with a scanner where we put people in this isolated condition, uh, a bore that's really like putting patients or subjects in a tin can and then hammering on the tin can and trying to measure their brain's activity. But nonetheless, that's what we do. And we can do things like, hmm. We can do things like um, measure or identify a language system by simply asking people to name pictures that we present to them through the mirror in the bore. And when we do that, we can actually map the language picture. But these people in the scanner can't speak. We do this by internal speech. We do it by asking them to think the name of the object, or to think something about its description, but not to speak. Because if they speak in the scanner, the head movement then destroys the images that we obtain. Nonetheless, with this internal speech process, we are able to measure the activity of the canonical language systems, which you are all so familiar with. The front of the brain. Actually, my pointer isn't working, so, you just, so I, I'm just going to point. So um, the front of the brain, Broca's area, the articulatory system associated with uh, uh, motor aspects of speech production, and Wernicke's area associated with uh, comprehension and, <clears throat> and uh, language uh, reception. Um, but now, we have a new technology, near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, which measures um, the same signal as functional MRI does, but in a different way. And so for some of you who aren't familiar with either functional imaging by traditional methods using the scanner or functional imaging using um, the new method of near-infrared spectroscopy, let me just start with a very simple fundamental principle that is necessary to understand the source of both signals. 
And that's a property of the brain. It's not a property about the technology. The property of the brain that's key here is the fact that active neural tissue recruits blood. It's just that simple. When parts of the brain are working, the blood is flowing specifically to that part. Now what's interesting about that is that the newly recruited blood is highly oxygenated. And so in those areas of brain that are neurally active, there is a change in the proportion of oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. Okay? So in functional MRI, the scanner is sensitive to the reduction in the proportion of deoxyhemoglobin. For all, anybody who might be interested in this, deoxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic. It distorts the magnetic resonance signal. So less of a distortion causes a signal increase. Am I killing my translator here? <laughs> we got that? OK. Um, all right. So the same thing happens in, in near-infrared spectroscopy, but it's a little bit simpler. We directly measure. The, the concentration of oxygen, and we directly measure the concentration of deoxyhemoglobin. We can look at the two together, um, and by the same theoretic, by the same method, actually identify areas that are active in the brain. So we have a system here of caps that we can put on people's heads that actually measure the proxy for neural activity by changes in the ratio of oxy to deoxyhemoglobin. This system is a very special system. It was made specially for us by Shimatsu, who has given us a large number of optodes so that we can cover two heads at once, um, so that we can do our experiments of eye-to-eye -eye contact or dialogue or any kind of interpersonal interaction uh, with two people together. And we also use eye tracking, um, as you can see by the glasses. We can know when people are looking at each other, and we can know when they're looking um, uh, at, what, at what they're looking at. Um, and I'm going to tell you a lot more about how near-infrared spectroscopy works, but I wanted you to keep this, this picture in mind. Let's turn to the theoretical framework. Why in the world would we be doing this experiment, these types of experiments? It is because we have this hypothesis, it's been around a very long time, that social interactions recruit specialized neural operations. I'm going to test that in two ways today. The first way is that I'm going to test it with a, an experiment that compares the neural effect of eye-to-eye -eye contact, we call that the interactive condition, with eye-to-picture contact. That is, just looking at a picture of a face with eyes. Is that different than actually looking at your partner and his or her eyes? And we're going to test that in the standard way, using contrast that compare neural activity, one condition with the other. We'll, connect, we'll test that with functional connectivity between areas of the brain. And also, with a new variable, we're actually going to look at the dynamic connections between two brains. And that is a variable that we don't see when we're looking at single brains alone. So this is a, a, a very exciting kind of new direction. The second experiment is exactly the same hypothesis, but we're going to do this with verbal spoken language. So we're going to have a condition where people are engaged in an interactive dialogue, and we'll compare that with the exact same condition with a, uh, a non-interactive monologue. Again, we'll test this hypothesis comparing two conditions, the dialogue condition and the monologue condition, uh, by comparing contrast, and then the interactive condition with the cross-brain coherence. So the roadmap of the talk, essentially, is that I'm, I'm going to give you a little introduction to um, near-infrared spectroscopy. It's a pretty exciting new technology that enables us to look at these specific hypotheses. And then I'm going to tell you about the eye-to-eye -eye interaction experiment, the talking and listening experiment. And then I want to try to unify a theoretical framework that puts the two together. And that's the part that's exciting 
um, I think, for me. But first, before I go on, uh, one of the most important slides of my talk is a slide that gives credit to the people in my laboratory who really do the work. So the first person, let's see here, Adam Noah there. Oh, by the way, these pictures are just snapshots in the lab. To make this slide, I went around with my Blackberry, and I just took pictures of people doing what they do all day long. And so um, <laughs> here they are. Um, Adam is telling everybody what to do, and the truth of the matter is he's a research scientist in my lab. He came with me from Columbia, and um, he's our chief engineer. Um, uh, Chen Zhang, uh, also a research scientist in my lab, uh, came with me from Columbia, and he's our chief computational neuroscientist. Ray Cappiello is our project manager, runs a tight ship, and uh, also came with us from Columbia. Um, Meanwhile, Jan Cruzacaro is our uh, laboratory assistant, uh, has joined us since we came to Yale. Um, Swetha Dravida is our MD-PhD student who is uh, doing some really brilliant work now on interpersonal interactions. Um, and we have two undergraduates, uh, Jenny Park and Olivia Descorbeth, who have been with the lab for um, since they've been at Yale and have made major contributions to the work that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, so a brief introduction to uh, NIRS. Um, uh, Franz Jobsis is credited with the discovery that um, oxygenation in the blood um, as uh, modified by hyperventilation uh, could be detected by near-infrared spectroscopy. And then the major seminal event occurred around 1991-1992 when Britton Chance and others discovered that they could detect activation-related changes in functional um, task-related task -related activities in the brain. Now, what's significant about that is that um, 1991 was, said, was the year that Seiji Ogama, Ogawa published his seminal uh, paper that uh, documented the um, blood oxygen level dependent signal for functional MRI. So these two technologies came online about the same time. Um, but functional magnetic resonance imaging with a scanner um, 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 became the predominant and conventional technology. And near-infrared spectroscopy hasn't really flourished um, partly because of uh, disadvantages of resolution, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later, and also um, the uh, difficulties of, um, of, of not getting signals on every subject. So um, the, the resolution and the difficulty of, of getting the images at all um, really limited the technology in favor of functional magnetic resonance imaging. However, the reason that one would use a technology like this is because you have a question that can't be asked any other way other than to do, so, do um, something that requires two people talking together. When you, when you want to study interactions, you have to have a technology that allows you to actually do imaging in real life interactions. So the reason that we would go to functional near-infrared spectroscopy is because we can't do it any other way. And so um, in 2012, there were four publications on NIRS with two brain imaging studies. And in 19, uh, 2015, we put out a couple. And this is a field now that's growing quite rapidly. There are a number of NIRS sites across the United States and Canada. Just want to point out that Gallaudet University is one of the major ones on my list here. And now this slide, and this slide is the most detailed slide of my talk, and it's the slide that tells you how this technology actually works. Um, and it's quite miraculous that it does. It's really, kind of, it's really a thing of beauty. But what happens is that we have emitters here that are emitting wavelengths of light that are generated from a remote laser that are the, the wave guide that brings it to the emitter, actually. Um, and the wavelengths are 780 
And you can see here from the absorbance spectra that the 780 actually is maximally uh, tuned to the absorbance spectra of deoxyhemoglobin. 805 maximally tuned to the equal point between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. And 830, which is maximally tuned to the absorption spectra of the oxyhemoglobin. We shoot all three wavelengths into the brain, and then we detect what comes out. And so we have detectors all around these emitters, and the detectors actually give us information about how much of that wavelength has been absorbed so that we can convert absorptions to con we can convert um, concentration measures to absorption, absorption to concentration, um, and determine what, the, what of the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin has used. That's our proxy of neural activity. That's how we know what's going on in the, those particular areas of the brain. Now, we localize these effects by identifying channels that exist between the emitters and the detectors. And um, these channels then are placed all over the entire brain, as I showed you. Um, and they can be used to um, um, quantify the changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, which is our proxy of neural activity. So here's how it really works. We have a, I'm going to do a demonstration with uh, the finger thumb tapping. We have a, a um, situation where a subject is wearing the cap, and there we have a, a paradigm with a block design so that finger thumb tapping goes on for 15 seconds, there's a rest for 15 seconds, they tap for 15 seconds, they rest and tap, and so on. And when that happens, you can see the oxyhemoglobin signal rising as a well-behaved hemodynamic signal does. It takes it about eight seconds to rise. It pretty much levels off. And when you stop the action, it falls to baseline in about 15 seconds. You start the action again. It rises slowly, falls slowly, and so on. This is a perfectly well-behaved hemodynamic response function. It's identical to what you see in the scanner. But here we have the advantage we can actually look also at the deoxyhemoglobin. Notice that it's perfectly anti-correlated with the oxyhemoglobin signal. As one goes up, the other goes down. But nonetheless, it behaves as a perfectly well-behaved uh, hemodynamic function. And so for every uh, run of data, for every experiment that we do, and usually our experiments go three minutes, which is 180 seconds, we collect this pile of data. And it is from this pile of data that we learn about the brain. There is no instruction book here. All the information that we have about the brain comes from signals that look just like this. And so this is as, as raw as it gets. We can start processing the data. We can do uh, lump all of the uh, events together. This is a single subject, event triggered averages. And then, of course, we study our phenomena in groups, and that just shows us our signal, the oxy signal and deoxyhemoglobin signal, um, as an example um, uh, with, with, with the group. Now, how does this compare with the functional MRI signal? Well, many people have done this, these experiments. Um, this is a particularly nice one by Sato, done in 2013. And because near infrared spectroscopy is fiber optics, it's it's magnetically cap I mean, it's, it's magnetically inert, so it can go in the scanner. So you can wear these things and put them in the scanner. It doesn't, and so you can run these experiments simultaneously. So here's uh, Sato, who did a working memory task. And notice he's looking at the front of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. The black line here is the uh, bold signal from the fMRI, and the red is the oxyhemoglobin signal. You can see they're extraordinarily well ca calibrated, as you would expect if you're measuring the same thing, and indeed they are. The correlation is 0.77. You can do the same thing with the deoxyhemoglobin signal. Notice that the correlation is just a little bit higher 
And that is, of course, because the deoxyhemoglobin signal is a little bit more closely related to what is actually being measured uh, in the scanner, although both signals serve as a pretty reasonable proxy. However, the two signals are not the same when it comes to localization because the oxyhemoglobin signal, and by the way, this is the, the same finger thumb tapping experiment that I just showed you. This is the group average with the oxyhemoglobin signal, and this is the deoxyhemoglobin signal. For those of you who know neuroanatomy, know perfectly well that this is the left side motor cortex and right side finger thumb tapping. This is the area that you expect to see. You don't expect to see half the brain lit up as you do there. Why is that so? That is because the oxyhemoglobin signal is being read by the systemic effects of blood flow. So it's reading the fact that the entire brain, um, of the superficial aspect of the cortex is recruiting blood. So it's, re it's telling us more about the general blood flow of the brain than it is a specific area that's actually doing the processing associated with finger thumb tapping. So although both signals in the same area are highly correlated, they do not tell you the same thing about the, um, uh, about the neural activity and where it is. Um, however, you can do uh, various types of signal processing by cleaning out the global mean, taking this away, and you can see that it's possible to um, identify the local area that's active. So uh, by signal processing, we can end up using both signals. Um, so um, I want to finish this little section off about the functional near-infrared spectroscopy by summarizing the advantages and disadvantages of the, uh, of, the, of the technology. The first and the most obvious one is the coarse and shallow spatial sampling, and that is our spatial sampling is limited to the grid of the optodes that we put on the head. We have a particularly um, rich grid in that we have two heads that are reasonably fully populated, but that's not the standard in the field. Usually the standard in the field uses patches of optodes. Um, the second disadvantage is that the signals are not acquired in all subjects. We don't know exactly why, but one of the reasons is that people with very thick skulls um, oftentimes uh, give us a weak signal. That's not always the case, but sometimes it is. Um, sometimes uh, fat deposits, we think, might have something to do with it. Um, and certainly, if people have hairstyles that we can't get the... Uh, a laser onto the head, that doesn't work. But that's, that's understandable. There are other reasons that we just don't understand. We, um, we have um, a technique in our laboratory where all of our experiments were done by asking people to come in and we do a preliminary study. We ask them to do finger thumb tapping and to do passive viewing of a flashing checkerboard. When we get signals in those experiments, then we invite them to come back and participate in the real experiment. Um, and that way, we never have the dilemma of having to exclude data that we wish we hadn't have collected. So the rule is, if they're in, they're in. If they're out, they're out. And we make that decision before we start the experiment. So NIRS has many advantages. Uh, first of all, and it, as I've been saying, it enables hypothesis testing of two brains simultaneously or any type of experiment where you want to have people um, in a natural environment where they can be uh, in an ecologically valid situation. You can use uh, near-infrared spectroscopy. So it's for those of us who have done so many imaging experiments in the scanner, it's like such a breath of fresh air. It's like freedom. You can actually do imaging experiments <laughs> and take people out of the bore. It's really cool, really cool. Um, other advantages, and this is a real gift, that um, near-infrared spectroscopy has extraordinarily high temporal resolution relative to fMRI. Uh, here we're acquiring signals from 10 to 30 milliseconds. And in the scanner, we acquire them at about one and a half to two seconds. So an order of magnitude better. And that makes it incredibly valuable for measures of functional connectivity. It's relatively insensitive to movement artifacts. So you can talk and move around. It's not totally insensitive. I mean, you can't jump around and move your head a lot. But you can, you can, um, uh, move a bit, and uh, that gives you a great deal more freedom. 
Um, we don't have a magnetic field we have to worry about. For all of those of you who have done functional imaging experiments, there's the problem of stuff getting in the bore, you know, the bobby pin that goes into the center of the bore, the dangers of functional magnetic resonance imaging having to do with a high magnetic field are all eliminated. Um, and the other advantage is, is that all the processing software, all of the tools for computation of these signals that we know how to do from functional imaging, we can do here. So we come to this new technology with a whole repertoire of computational tools that suit us. Okay, so in this case, in this premise, I'm going to tell you this is our layout of channels um, for the two participants, right and left hemispheres, and um, we I identify the locations of each of those channels on every subject using the 1020 system. Um, that is used uh, traditionally with EEG. It's, uh, they're digitized automatically, um, and then we know the XYZ coordinates for all of the uh, channels for every subject, and then all of our analyses from then on are based on the standard brain analyses. Okay, so now the experiments. So this is the fun part. So I'm going to tell you about the eye-to-eye -eye versus eye-to-picture experiment because it is the simplest way that I could think of to test this really important hypothesis that interpersonal interactions via eye-to-eye -eye contact or via anything engage specialized neural systems. So this is the experiment. People sit across the table from each other, as in the case of the picture I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And they, I'll explain to you the paradigm in a minute, but basically we compare people looking at each other versus people looking at a picture, again, in both cases, targeting the eye. Um, and the paradigm is this. There's a, a standard three-minute run um, with blocks of activity and rest, activity and rest. And in the block of activity, there are three events. And that is the on event, our subjects look at each other or the picture for three seconds, and then they look away. They divert their gaze 10 degrees. Look on for three seconds and then away, on for three seconds and then away. From an analysis point of view, this entire block is treated as a single activity block versus rest. And so you can imagine the finger thumb tapping data that I showed you is a nice proxy for this on, off, on, off, on, off, and you can imagine the oxy signal and the deoxy signal and counter-correlation in response to this. And the question is, do those signals differ when the subjects are looking at each other or when they're looking at the picture? And in one case, I claim that there's an interaction component, and here I claim that there is not. Now, this, any difference that I saw could be due to eye movements, eye, or to eye behavior, that is, their gaze. And so our subjects wore um, uh, eye tracking devices, and we were able to track their gaze for every single condition. And so this is a, an example of two participants here, um, where the blue is one participant and the red is the other, and you can see the time series on the on, off, on, off, on, off, rest. And similarly, for each of the epics in the experiment, whether it's eye to eye and eye to picture, and the, the comparison over the group provided no evidence that there was any difference between either condition, eye to eye or eye to picture. And the same was true when we looked at the eye gaze. So think of this as the window where um, the, the eye was in the picture or the, or the real person. So this is the eye window. And you can see that the distribution of gaze targets did not differ between the eye-to-eye -eye condition or the eye-to-picture condition. And that was true throughout the whole group, as I, as I just said. So if we see a difference between these two conditions, we don't conclude that it was due to eye behavior we conclude that it was due to the brain. And that's why this control was so important. So let's look at our hypotheses. 
what are our, our hypothetical outcomes here? Well, the first outcome is that there's no difference. And I regarded that as a very likely outcome when I started this experiment, because essentially, this experiment was designed to fail. It was designed to fail because the control condition, the eye to picture, was very much like the eye to face. And in fact, in the, in the whole history of brain imaging with functional MRI, we study the effect of eye contact by putting people in the scanner and showing them pictures. And that has been the canonical paradigm for understanding the effect of eye contact. So there is a perfectly good reason to think that this experiment would show no difference between the two conditions. The second likely hypothesis is that, that if there was a difference, that the difference would be back here in the back of the brain having to do with face sensitivity and the visual cortex. We would think that the difference would be visual. This is the visual experiment. The third hypothesis is that the eye to eye greater than eye to picture really revealed a language component associated with eye to eye contact. And there are many people in the circles that I talked to thought that that was a ridiculous hypothesis. I should have come down here and talked to you guys because you know the answer. <laughs> Most of the people that I talked to did not know the answer. Okay, so this is um, the, the results in, in this, for this particular experiment come in two parts. The first is the um, contrast part where I simply compare all the activity for all the subjects. There are 38 subjects here um, with, uh, um, uh, with the eye to picture versus um, eye to eye. And um, with extraordinarily, in fact, this was the, the results are actually, they sort of look kind of modest here because here it is. Uh, this is. This is our result right there. Um, um, and of course, that's Broca's area for all of you who know the neuroanatomy. But I've cranked this way down uh, looking at this at P.001 level of significance. And the reason I did that um, was because I wanted to use this as a seed to look at what it's connected to in order to get the entire, the entire uh, uh, system. However, notice that our first result here that's not the visual system, and that's not nothing. What is that? That's Broca's area. That's language production. So we're starting to see the emergence of our third hypothesis, that eye-to-eye -eye contact reveals the language system. Now, truth, this, this fuzzy um, color system represents the real truth about our, our spatial resolution. The colors more or less represent the various areas that are shown, um, that are represented by our, our, our sampling matrix here. And I'll say more about that later. But when we ask our atlas what areas are in this particular cluster that we've identified here, we see, according to the atlas, pars opercularis, which of course you all know, Broman's area 44, Broca's area the premotor cortex having to do with the articulatory system um, and the, the subcentral area. What is the subcentral area? Don't feel bad if you don't know what it, know what it is. Nobody else does either. In fact, I talked to a group of neurosurgeons yesterday about this. They said, ah, it's a silent area of the brain. We take it out all the time. We'll see. Um, anyway. Um, I'll say more about that later. I'm not ending this discussion about the subcentral area with that, but, there's, but, but let's go on and then we'll come back to it. So, so we use this, this area that is the high contrast spot, and we use it as a seed. And we say, what is it connected to during the contrast, during the condition of eye to eye versus eye to picture? And what we see is it's connected to a very large part here in the temporal parietal part of the brain. And here we put our matrix back on, and we 
put, the, I regard this color field as sort of the, um, the, the um, it's sort of the honesty picture. It tells us how, really, how fuzzy our, our resolution really is. But the areas that are involved, that are associated with that cluster, somatosensory cortex, subcentral area again, and superior temporal gyrus, which as you all know, is Wernicke's area, subcentral again, somatosensory, which is not too, un, not, not, not un understandable since this is a face task. So what do we have? Our eye to eye experiment reveals, first off, the productive parts of the brain, motor cortex, articulatory system, and Broca's area. The receptive, comprehensive part of the language system plus the somatosensory areas. And if one wants to look at that in terms of a more common model, we see that the eye to eye contact just said in a different way. We've got the posterior aspects, the frontier aspect, plus this new player, the subcentral area. But here we have eye-to-eye -eye contact with another person, differing from eye-to-picture eye contact and revealing for us the language system. So let's just go back and pick up what in the world is this subcentral area. Um, we have to go back to Brodman, actually, who identified the area in 1909, and I relying on uh, Larry Gary's uh, translation, which he did. And I'd just like to read this to you because I think it's really instructive. The subcentral area is formed by the union of the pre and post central gyri at the inferior end of the central sulcus. Right there, it's a very central place in the brain. There is no way that area does nothing. Taking up that real estate in that high rent district, no way. It's got to be a very important area. Um, anyway, from its architecture, this area belongs to the post-central cortex. It extends widely over the inner surface of the operculum and has a distinct boundary with the insular cortex. So it sits for in the center of the brain and it's connected to a lot of things. Um, so just hang on to that. Um, the, the function, if you look up anywhere in any text, uh, the subcentral area is unknown. But I think that in this type of work, we're going to discover what the subcentral area does. Anyway, um, let's go on to how these brains are connected to each other during eye-to-eye -eye contact. And this is one of the most exciting sort of parts of this type of work because we actually now have a way of looking at the connection between two brains during an interaction. So I do this by um, taking my, all of my channels and I identify the regions, and that's what those colors that I've been telling you about uh, represent. So I have 42 channels to start with, and I reduce them to 12 regions of interest just by combining them. And this does a lot of nice things for me. Um, it increases my signal to noise ratio so that my computations are a little easier to do. It decreases the risk of false positives because I have less chance of, of um, multiple comparison problems. And I remove the, I can use a, a wavelet and remove the main effect due to task and time series so that um, I just have less computational burden here by doing this and the computations uh, are a lot more interpretable. So my first job in looking across two brains is to simplify the um, acquisition matrix. But what do I really do when I do that? Well, we've adopted a, a, a technique of correlating, oh, correlating the signals from one brain area to another brain area by taking the signal from the region, that is the combined channels, decomposing it into wavelets. So the component parts of the wavelets are sort of represented in this axis there. So we have the high frequency and the low frequency. So we take little bits of the decomposed signal and we ask how are these little bits of signal correlated across the two brains. Um, so 
if we see that signals from the two brains are in sync or in line, we say that that coherence is high. And we would take that as evidence for a, a social interaction between the two people. If we saw that they were not aligned in the case of the occluded situation, or not aligned in any situation, actually, then we would say that that is evidence for no connection between the individuals. And so that it makes our hypothesis really clear. We expect the coherence to be high during the eye-to-eye -eye condition, and we expect it to be low during the uh, eye-to-picture condition, even though they're doing a mutual task. And furthermore, because I've divided the brain up into areas, I expect that this analysis to tell me something about what parts of the brain are associated with the interpersonal interaction. So OK, so this is the first the first set of data, and it's actually extraordinarily exciting. First of all, I'm seeing, I'll explain everything there is to you about this because this is really cool stuff. Um, when I'm looking at a correlation between two brains, between middle temporal gyrus and the superior temporal gyrus. Now, all of you guys that know about neuroanatomy know perfectly well that this is, this is all input, it's related to uh, Wernicke's area, it has to do with reception, oftentimes of visual information, um, sometimes even auditory information, but early input processing. Okay, so these two areas across the two brains are highly correlated. And the reason I say that is because of this evidence right here. What we see on the y-axis is the coherence, and that is the extent to which the signals are correlated. That's the extent to which they're aligned. They're working in sync. If it's high, they're working, they're very highly synchronized, and if it's low, they're not. This x-axis here are the wavelet components. These are the little ones, the high frequency ones, and this is just pretty much noise down here. This one here is the low frequency one, and it is the one that represents the task, the slow frequency, the, the active period, the rest period, the active period, the rest period, the 15 second cycle. Here it's represented as a 30 second period. Well, it's wave, but that should be, that should be period actually. Um, but this is the low frequency stuff. So what do we see? We see that the red in the eye-to-eye -eye condition is much more highly correlated than the blue, which is the eye-to-picture condition. Now, that's pretty cool because these bars right here are telling me that that separation between those two functions is very significant. P.01 over all of those wavelengths is telling me that when people are looking at each other, these parts of the brains are cohering, and when they don't look at each other, they are not. Now, what is this over here? This says, I want to know if this is really has anything to do with social interaction or not. And so what we do is I scramble the partners. So just computationally, I just, just make the partners not real. And I see that the correlation goes away. And so I conclude that during eye to eye, that the Wernicke's area related uh, pieces of the brain are highly correlated. And that is true with other areas from the same, other regions from the same area. Again, superior temporal gyrus to supramarginal gyrus. And this one's very interesting, middle temporal gyrus to the premotor cortex. Now, the premotor cortex is really interesting because it may well be the connection between the back of the brain and the front of the brain, between the two brains being connected. That's a flight of ideas. Uh, it's an interpretation that's slightly beyond the data, but nonetheless, it's a very strong uh, correlation. Okay, so what do we have? Um, we have two people looking at each other, and in the process of looking at each other, they are activating a conventional language system plus the subcentral area, and what's going on between their two brains is highly correlated in this part of the brain, the back of the brain, not the front of the brain. Um, and I like to refer to that as a social synapse. 
the social synapse. That means, you know the synapse, like a neuron, it's got, it, it has its synaptic junction. One synapse fires, something is, goes out, and the other synapse gets it. And that's what happens here in the brain. There's something very important going on between the connection of these two brains. It's very much like a synapse. So, all right. What do we say? That the neural pathways are special, that are specialized for language are active during eye-to-eye -eye contact. You guys all knew that. We didn't know that, but you knew that. That the cross-brain coherence between the temporal and the parietal signals suggests that there is a neural specialization for social interaction. And furthermore, that that special coherence exists down here in the temporal parietal signs and not in the front of the brain. That the coherence between brains is part of the back of the brain, not the front of the brain. Okay, the reason that I yellowed this is because it predicts what I should see in my next experiment, where I actually put people in front of each other and have them talking to each other. I should see exactly the same thing that I see in the eye-to-eye -eye contact. And so, we do another experiment. And in this experiment, by the way, I, I love this picture. Um, it was a picture that an artist drew. She gave me permission to use it, B. Johnson, um, uh, illustrating a little opinion piece that Jamie McPartland and I uh, wrote for Spectrum uh, last month. And it just happened to be part of the uh, magazine that put that out. But I think it's so nice. Anyway. Um, in this experimental paradigm, I have two conditions. See? Okay. I have two conditions. Um, are people talking in monologue and dialogue, and I'm going to tell you exactly what that is in a minute. And in every case, we have a dyad where one person's talking and one person's listening. Okay? And I'll show you how that works. So let's take the old picture naming task that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Where you see a picture, you name it, and you tell something about it. And that we know that that is sufficient to activate the language system. I'll say more about that in a few slides, but let me tell you about this paradigm. In the monologue condition, the participant one gets a picture, as is here. And Participant one talks about the clock. Participant two just listens, okay? And then participant two gets his picture. He talks about his coconut. Participant one just listens. And then the next 15 second epic, participant one gets her picture. Oh, that's the wrong picture. But anyway, uh, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Talking and listening, talking and listening. They both seeing the pictures, but nobody talks to each other. So it's monologue, okay? So now let's do this in dialogue. OK, here we go. Um, so uh, participant one gets, gets the picture and talks about it. So we start it off with the first, first epic. Then participant two gets his picture. But he doesn't talk about his picture immediately. He lingers on the comments made by, sub, by participant one. And so he comments on the clock. He says things like, yeah, you know, my clock stopped running, blah, 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 you know, uh, clock, clock, clock. But then let me tell you about my picture. I have a coconut. Let me tell you about the coconut, blah, blah, blah. And then, so he goes on about the coconut. And then the subject one gets her picture. It's a camera or whatever. But she doesn't talk immediately about the camera. She says, yeah, you know, I hate coconuts too. You know, whatever you said about the coconut reminds me of the time, blah, blah, blah. And so then she said, now my picture is a camera. So they have this game that they play where they go back and forth and back and forth about their new picture and the comments from the old picture. Now, it sounds kind of complicated. These are Yale undergraduates. They have no difficulty at all. They just talk all the time about everything. And, <laughs> and so, um, the, uh, they have no difficulty doing this uh, game of, with interpersonal interaction or without. Now, why this picture naming task? And it's because of our old work, we and, and many, many, many other people 
who mapped the language system with the scanner using functional MRI for neurosurgical planning. So on single subjects, we would ask people to do picture naming and listening to words, and we would identify subject by subject the specific language areas associated uh, with those tasks for that, those subjects. And the reason that this was important was because that this we were like we were mapping in a what we called a, a zone of zero tolerance for error. These were single subjects, and we were mapping their language systems so that the surgeon could do surgeries around that language system without hurting the language system. So we had to get it right. So I used the, the object naming task to do that. And here, this is a subject. Um, I mean, this was one of our people from one of our publications. You see this huge tumor here. I mapped Broca's area. And then always the surgeon would go in and check whether I got it right or not. And so he would do his, his intraoperative cortical stimulation technique and achieve speech arrest where I told him that Broca's area was. Now that's the hallmark of Broca's area, of course. So I know with this task that I could target these areas with absolute certainty. And so that is why I use this task again when I wanted to target Wernicke's area, Broca's area in particular. So let's look at the paradigm here for the experiment that I just told you about, the monologue dialogue experiment. The first thing we want to do is to analyze the data over all the conditions, monologue and dialogue, just to see if I got it right. The conditions don't matter, just did I get it right? Am I really looking at Broca's area and Wernicke's area? Well, okay, so we, just to be sure, we analyze the data three different ways. The first way is the, condition, the traditional way with um, uh, voxel analysis, the way we do an fMRI, so we pretend we pretend that we do fMRI experiments, and we smear the data out over the whole brain, and then we, we artificially tile it in these tiny little things that look like voxels that you, uh, you actually acquire with functional MRI, and then we analyze the data as if it were voxel-based. But nonetheless, we get Broca's area, Wernicke's area, and articulatory part of the brain, and some frontal stuff. But so we don't really believe that, but that's a nice description. Now we do it channel-wise. I look at each single channel by itself. And by the way, I'm doing a lot of subjects here, 58 subjects. And we see the same pattern of activity. Broca's area, Wernicke's area, motoric aspects of speech. And then I, I say, okay, I'm not gonna believe anything that I don't see on both analyses. And so then I look at my channels and I look at my voxel analysis and I say, okay, these are my regions of interest. This is my finding. And by George, it matches exactly what I expect from this task. And so that encouraged us to go on and finish the analysis for this experiment. So then the first thing we do is we look at the monologue condition. To look at the monologue condition, of course, we're comparing talking and listening, talking and listening for all my subjects over the monologue. So here we go, the voxel-wise analysis, the channel-wise analysis, and the combined analysis. And you can see we're basically seeing the same things um, as we did before, a little bit of variation. Just take note of that one because the next one is the dialogue condition, and we see the voxel-wise analysis, the channel-wise analysis, and both together. Now, of course, the, the, the hypothesis of this experiment is addressed when we compare the two, the monologue and the dialogue. So we do that. Look at that. Look at that. Monologue, dialogue. Essentially, no difference in the frontal part of the brain, Broca's area, but one huge difference down here in the Wernicke's area receptive comprehensive part of the brain. So we analyze these, the signal strength. Now this is a true 
uh, region of interest analysis, where you take the actual signals uh, from your region of interest and you say, in these areas, are they different? And you can see what you can see here, you can see here, the signals are not different. But here, if you take our region of interest, determined by the all analysis that I showed you first, and compare that, those signals up there with these signals, these are different. It's p-value of 0.04. It's not huge, but it is, but it, but it's significant. And this is a very conservative approach. So these data say pretty resoundingly that the difference between the monologue and the dialogue condition it is uh, resides essentially here in the Wernicke's area part of the brain. So what happens with the cross-brain coherence? We have a very strong prediction based on our eye-to-eye -eye condition, that we think that if these two, these two conditions tweak the language system similarly, that the cross-brain coherence is going to be observed, again, from the posterior or the receptive parts of the brain. And here's our answer. There's only one coherence. Now, this coherence is, is quite difficult, I think. And this because the reason I only have one really main finding here and that is because these two people that I'm, that I'm coherent, that we're looking at the coherence between, are doing different things. One is talking and one is listening. And yet their brains are synchronizing with respect to the signals that come from this area, superior temporal gyrus, and what? The subcentral area. The superior temporal gyrus and the subcentral area. Again, pretty much back of the brain. And this guy. Um, still, I, back of the brain, but something special about that position in the back of the brain. OK. So looking at our model, first, I want you to notice that uh, like the eye-to-eye -eye condition of person one and person two, and we have the same areas. Except here in, in the talking experiment, we have two functions, sending and receiving, that is talking and listening. And remember in the eye-to-eye -eye condition, those two lines were just scrunched together. So here we separated out two people, but in the eye-to-eye -eye condition, that it was one line. The two systems are essentially the same. cross-brain synchrony here again occurs was observed in the back of the brain this time to the subcentral area as opposed to the, the, the frontal aspect of the brain but nonetheless the notion that in in conversation in talking and listening that the connection between the two brains that occurs in those two conditions is evidenced by the fact that there's coherence between the signals that uh, reside in the posterior aspect of the brain, Wernicke's area. So, wrapping it up, there is a neuroscience of two. That is, this really is a productive area of science. That there's riches here in looking at two brains together that we haven't seen before, looking at single brains. So this is a new direction. This is a barrier that we can break to now look at two brains as opposed to just one. That these interacting brains engage specialized and interacting neural processes. And in this case, the data suggests that the temporal parietal regions of the brain are specialized for this interaction between two individuals and uh, interaction that's associated with language. And it doesn't matter whether it goes eye to eye or ear to ear. It seems to be pretty much the same thing. So as neuroscientists, we like to take our results and put them in sort of a larger model context. And so oftentimes, we borrow models from engineers. We're shameless about it. 
We just take models from people that have them from different other parts of, the, of disciplines, and we incorporate them on biology. And so I think the model that applies here are models of wireless devices. The brain is a wireless device. We talk and receive, we send and receive. And where are the models of wireless devices? Well, they started back here around World War II when we learned how to make walkie-talkies. And so these walkie-talkies did smart things like one guy would send and one guy would receive and then he would send and then he would receive. And these devices were really smart because they knew how to do that. And the engineers figured it out. Now these guys, these brains up here in these helmets, they're doing the same thing, but we don't know how. But we know how these walkie-talkies are working. And so let's see if these device models actually can provide any insight into the way we structure our models about how two brains work together. And so conceptualize two cell phones. And the cell phones are sending and receiving and sending and receiving. And then imagine that they're doing this um, by um, layers, systems of activity that have been laid out by these engineers um, to make it happen between our cell phones. And this is borrowed from what's called, in this case, the open systems interconnection models or OSI models. These are so standard and so old that it's hard to find original references for them. Um, everybody just says, oh yeah, according to the OSI model, there's this and this and this and this and this, and by George, these, these connecting devices work. And the question is, can we use these, this model um, substrate to develop models of interaction between two brains? And I think that we can. I think that the work that we've done so far takes us away down this train. There's a whole lot of other stuff one can imagine that uh, is related to the internal processes having to do with memory, attention, association, cognition, um, all kinds of other cognitive processes that are associated in communication, not to mention the difficulties of interpreting uh, micro, micro expressions, eye contact, body gestures, and so on. There's many, many, many aspects to this model that um, need to be represented, but if we can begin to structure this whole problem in terms of the engineering of wireless systems communicating, I think that um, we have sort of a head start. So with that, um, I just wanted to share with you some of the future directions that we have in my lab. Um, one of the first things that we're doing following this work is that um, we have just been funded to do a study of uh, communications in autistic individuals, uh, looking at uh, uh, characterizations of uh, communication and social systems in individuals that um, are very likely to uh, inform us about um, a social disability. Um, we're working very hard to um, characterize the communication of emotion with mo and facial expression and gestures. We have some um, uh, facial characterization software that we got from, um, actually, it was, actually it was created for Homeland Security. And uh, we're using that to look at uh, um, facial expressions and how they're generated and communicated. So I think it's a very important area of research. We have some very active programs looking at a neurocircuitry when people have conversations where they agree and disagree, high and low disparity, people are talking to each other that are very different or very alike, and of course, we're always developing new technology. Um, we're adding EEG to our FNIR systems now. We've got eye tracking, motion capture, audio visual recordings, and virtual reality are just things that we're working with for our next genre of, of experiments. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk, inspiring, and let's open new doors and new frontiers. So we have 15 minutes for, talk, for questions. I will be very, very strict today. So I will leave the mic here. 
please come on stage either to ask your question in ASL or in English, but make sure you come here. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, for a beautiful talk. Thank you. Um, I, I like the idea of the neuroscience for two. And I'm tempted to see if I can find two small people to put into the MRI machine together. <laughs> That's <laughs> been tried, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I can see in your, in your future studies that you're applying this to, to different kinds of populations. Yes, yes. And um, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about uh, the variability between the people that you have been studying. You, you, more than many of us, look at single subject data much more because of your interest in pre-surgical planning. Many of us, we just group across large groups. Yes. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the variability in these kinds of situations. And also, you know, when you show the image of the paradigm and the setup, I can't help but think of the work by people like Deborah Tannen, who's a linguist at Georgetown University, uh -huh. who did these lovely um, videos of putting young children into the room and just see what they would do. And when you put two girls in the room, they would take the two chairs that were placed there and they would pull them together and they would look at each other and they would talk. And the boys would take the chairs and put them in different spots and they would look into the air and not talk. And so I, my point here is that different people have different drive to have these kinds of interactions, and I just was wondering if you've captured any of that in some of your data. An excellent question. Thank you so much. Um, first, uh, you have, there's many questions embedded in, in, in your comments, but the first one about um, variability of the subjects, and then I'll talk about variability in the paradigms. Um, um, Subjects vary a lot, and you'll notice that my sample size is high. And that's because I can't power these experiments with the normal uh, uh, sample sizes that we normally would do. Now the variation, uh, the source of the variation is hard to put my hands on. It could very well be the source of the variation has to do with the variability of where the cap is placed. It could very well be related to the difficulties of some people getting the signal through the skull. So some people have a much better signal than others. So there's some very technical sources of variability. But there's also the chance, and a very good chance, that there's a big difference between individuals as they communicate with each other. For example, in the eye-to-eye -eye contact experiment, some people reported that they were very comfortable looking at each other, and other people found it quite aversive, actually. Um, in some conversations that people had, uh, there, there were easy conversations, and others were quite stressed. And so there are the, there's the, the affinity for interpersonal interactions. So this sort of sets the stage for the need to do a number of additional studies. In my being cognizant of those variables. In my study, I randomly mixed all of my subjects. The genders were mixed, their, where they came from were mixed, and I, because I didn't want to study any of those things. And so I just mixed them all up and I said, okay, if my sample size is large enough, none of those things are gonna affect my data. I'm just gonna pay the price of having a little bit more noise. But if I restricted my samples to say, only women, or only men, or mixed, or, or young people or, and, and old people, or other types of variations, I may very well see differences. And that makes this work very exciting. Very exciting, actually. So I think there's a lot, of, a lot ahead for us. That's a, that's a great question. And I've dreamed for a long time of putting two people in the scanner never worked. <laughs> so, and of course, there have been some very heroic people, as you know, Rod Montague and, and others, Sato, have, that have chain scanners together. 
and they can almost get it because you can get with these video cameras and one person doing one thing and then the other person in the other scanner doing the other thing, but there's delays and the interaction is still not natural. It's not spontaneous. And one of the things that, that we've discovered, particularly in the eye-to-eye -eye experiment, is that all of the activity that you see correlated, uh, you saw my, my, my covariation maps, the, the coherence maps, that the, the, the wavelengths that where the coherence difference exists, those are wavelets that represent higher frequencies um, uh, than the task. And so these are all micro things going on that aren't task related. And that's where the action is, I think. And you miss that totally when we scan, when we chain scanners together. A good question, thank you. at the first one in the autism studies. Oh, the autism? Yeah, the autism. I'm looking at predictions. Okay, good. Like uh, as a monologue versus a dialogue. Is it possible that you get more dysynchrony in a dialogue condition in autistic individuals because of the difficulty of the sensory overload that they may have between the visual and listening at the same time and where they may actually prefer just like if they could not to even see the other face and just listen. And so looking at the receptive region, and, I, and of course, this really is linking both hemispheres, kind of, in terms of the, you know, like the facial expressions and everything. So I'm just curious to see what you're thinking would happen if it was a monologue versus a dialogue condition. It's a really, really interesting question. Um, I'm not brave enough to go there yet. What we're doing is starting with the eye-to-eye -eye contact because it's passive and because the literature tells us that eye-to-eye -eye behaviors in autistic individuals are quite predictive of their the condition. And so we're going to look at that circuitry first. And then, and then I'll try to work on the, the more advanced problem of the communication with spoken words. We may or may not get there, but we're starting with the eye-to-eye -eye contact. That's a really, really insightful question. Yeah, I, I just relate always to something I heard in NPR radio. I can listen, or like, you can tell me, I can listen or I can look at you, but I can't do both at the same yeah. time. And so that's why also besides all the research it just would be fascinating, but that is very, very complex to analyze, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. The ideas were incredibly pleasing thought-provoking and um, absolutely compelling. The idea of the neuroscience for two is really innovative, pioneering, and um, a very rich area to come. And as I um, looked at the neurocircuitry that was activated when the two people were talking, as compared to people who, let's say, were looking at the pictures, one of the things that struck me is that in both cases, in both experiments, the neural circuitry was similar to the neural circuitry for language. And so what I'm wondering is how can we tease apart the neural circuitry that's stemming from the communicative, inter the social communicative interaction so subtracted from language interaction, language. And I had a thought about an experiment. What if you did your, you have your eye, eye to eye, uh -huh. plus their language and listening and talking. What if you had, I thought, how would you differentiate this? What if you had them do, they close their eyes, you blindfold them, and you have them engaged in the same experiment. So there you, 
would you get, I hope you would get different neural circuitry or overlapping but not identical neural cir circuitry if you want to identify what's uniquely the neuroscience of the social interaction as compared to what is the neuroscience for human language. In the experiment, uh, great idea. In the experiment that we did, the monologue dialogue experiment, the subjects did not see each other. They were occluded already. So in a way, that's the same as closing their eyes. They did not see each other. So they were only talking, but not looking. So in, in that experiment, um, there were, it was just ear to ear, and the other was just eye to eye. And the results were in the interactive condition, what you saw here. I don't know how we would separate it out any farther. the neural signature of two versus the neural signature of language. Yeah. They're so overlapping that right. I want to see what is the causal uh, or subtraction. What, what yeah. is the neural circuitry for two? Because it's so tantalizingly similar to the neural sci yeah. uh, okay? And that really, um, uh, because you, know, you have the STG and the STG right. is for phonetic, segmentation, which is, we know have pre-existing tracks to brokers. They could be subvocalizing. They could be attempting to name. They could be, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we still don't know what, it's right. still so powerfully linguistic. How, uh, what is, what tells you this is the neural circuitry for two? This is the neural circuitry for human language. Well, I mean, you're, you're, solely, you're, you're totally right about there being some ambiguity there. But I think that the, the power of this, of this paradigm is that, as my, my argument that I've got two people in both conditions, but I have a monologue with no interaction and a dialogue with maximum interaction, if you will. And so then the comparison really separates out the, the tunus, takes the tunus away, and says what we're looking at is interaction over non-interaction. And in a sense, that's what I tried to do with the eye to eye. I took out the tunus and left the interaction with the real person versus the, the picture. Now, this is one experiment, and clearly, there are many, many ways that this should be approached in order to um, address your question of separating out what is tunus and what is language. Oh, that's a really good point. Thank you. Okay, we're taking our last question. And I want to piggyback on that. So. Um, I'm thinking relative to sign language uh -huh. that uh, two individuals could have a subtle conversation with subtle signing, not overt emotive signing, but uh, could converse uh -huh. and still not create too much noise for your studies. At the time that a sign language interpreter, the ones we have here, are taking in by eye and by ear, the language and putting it out in a different modality. They're having a lot of frontal activity. I'm pretty confident a lot of frontal activity. They gotta think about what it is you're saying, what you mean, what they're hearing, what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And in the discourse model, there was frontal activity. The person who was no, in the monologue activity, there was a lot of frontal lobe noise, a lot of frontal, no frontal noise um, behavior. There was, there was activity there. There was activity. So as I'm thinking about the picture I'm going to describe, my executive brain has to tune in. As I'm listening to what you're describing, my executive brain went on rest. 
I'm just activating all of those language centers, Wernicke's and Broca's. Interpreters have to have activity in all of those areas. And I'm really curious about that insular cortex ah. for memory. They have to hold on to information for so long in order to retrieve it and submit it back out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if your insular cortex is playing a role in that memory. What do you have to say? Well, that subcentral area down there is connected to the insular cortex. <laughs> and uh, uh, may well be a very important part of that. By the way, the, your discussion about in, interpreters is really interesting. Um, when I was at, uh, running the Functional Imaging Center at Columbia, I had an opportunity to do functional imaging on the interpreters for the United Nations. And so we they put them in the scanner and they did these wonderful um, in, in a translation um, tasks for us versus various controls. And the observation was, just as you described, is that the literally, the, it looked like the brain had a seizure. The whole brain, <laughs> The whole brain was going at full full speed ahead, frontal lobe, back of the lobe, bilateral. There was no unilateral activity, and in all of the interpreters. And what is so interesting is that um, each of the interpreters described how difficult their job was and how exhausted they were at the end of uh, of an interpretation session, and how the rules of the United Nations forbid them from doing interpreting over long periods of time because of the absolute exhaustion of this task, of using so much of the brain. So um, you're, you're totally right. With demands of the language become as high as multiple modalities, both and multiple directions of information flow in and out, um, that the, it's amazing that the brain can do it. It does it well in some very talented people. Um, and um, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a remarkable task that, that requires an incredible amount of brain power and energy. Anyway, thank you for pointing that out. Anyway, yes, that's, uh, so you were suggesting maybe that the subcentral area had something to do with um, holding information in sort of um, a workspace, a memory workspace, a short-term memory, and using it for language, very likely. Um, I think it's very interesting that that subcentral area only shows up when we're doing interactive tasks only. It doesn't show up in any um, non-interactive tasks, which may have something to do with why we've never seen it in the scanner, because they've never done interactive tasks in the scanner. And so um, I was very pleased um, yesterday after talking to some of our neurosurgeons, they're going to think twice about taking it out. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Thank you for answering our questions, your talk. Um, three comments, quick comments. Thank you to everyone for being here. We have a reception just outside, so please join for the reception and maybe ask a few more questions to Dr. Joy Hirsch. And if you have a questionnaire about um, the, the, the survey, please fill it out and leave it on the table here before leaving. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, great audience. Let's see here.